Thank you for the, for the nice introduction. Um, so as the logos on the right say, I come from you university. Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I always keep moving around, but I'll try. Uh, so the logos on the right uh, basically tell my affiliation. I come from University of Ljubljana. I had the AI lab there. Um, and our passion recently, not recently actually, our passion for the last 10 years is really in uh, um, healthcare projects. Um, Hence the title, really. And uh, apologies go to the organizers, really, because this was really a last minute edition and it was a, a very fortunate uh, period uh, with the end of the semester, right? Um, but nevertheless, so it's a general title, as you might have noticed, uh, to be as broad as possible, but I did change it a little bit. So I have two introductory slides. So the changes from AI slash ML in healthcare, it's just ABML in healthcare. So just this tiny, tiny little difference. So ABML is a technique that we've been developing since a long time now. Um, it's really a technique in machine learning that I feel could be well suited, especially for smaller data sets. Um, because with big data sets, Yahoo size or Google size, um, you know, they can fully automate many things, but with um, with small data set, you really need to get any information possible, and that is especially important to get the information from the domain experts, so the clinicians, biologists, anyone that can help you, actually. So ABML is not really only a machine learning method. It's actually just changing some of the existing methods, um, but it's also a way how to communicate uh, or primarily it's the way how to communicate with uh, with domain experts and to get as much of out of them as possible. So just to give you an example of uh, of um, of a possibility that can happen in small data sets, um, there will always be some uh, spurious correlations and correlations just occur by chance. Um, so for example, uh, a machine learning algorithm as naive as it is, would perfectly learn that pneumonia in this particular data set of just three patients uh, is because of the gender. If you're male, then you have pneumonia, which is not true, of course. So how do you correct? And, and, and this could also happen in the, in the validation and the test set if you're unlucky because these data sets are really small. So it's not impossible, and you can end up with a model that is just not valid uh, in the end. So... Involving a domain expert, uh, the domain expert first, after he or she stops laughing at uh, the, the stupidity of the, of the, of the mo learned model, uh, will of course correct you and will be selecting a, one of the patients. For example, the second one here will just say, okay, you know, it's not because he, in this particular case, is male, but it's because of the high fever, of course. And uh, we pick that up as an, we call it as an argument, um, as you can see, it's quite basic, just basically in the description of the, of the, of the patient. Um, it's pointed out by an expert. We believe it and we force the algorithm. So basically we constrain the machine learning algorithm to um, take this argument into account. Actually, it has to. Um, and in this particular case, then it relearns the theory, the model, uh, and become, and gets a much better explanation. Actually, the accuracy as well, it, it was not our main point to get a, a better algorithm, in, a better model in terms of accuracy, but a more explainable, more, more trustworthy one in that, uh, in that sense. Um, what also happens here is that uh, it, we just by explaining one um, case, it will usually explain many others that are, that are actually similar. Okay, how does this work? Um, I'm, I'm not going to be too technical here. Uh, I don't have the time to, to, to go into this. I'll keep it on high level. So basically, ABML is not just in the algorithm, as I said before. It's uh, this kind of continuous loop that involves the domain expert. And um, we've done this. I have the fortune that my, my best friend is a neurologist. So we've tried this in a, in a, in a data set. I'll show uh, later on just to, to see the size of it. Um, and, you know, if I come to him and I ask him a, a really difficult question, he's an expert in, in Parkinson's disease. And if I say, okay, Diane, please explain this Parkinson to me. And you know what? Just do it in two sentences. 
Of course, uh, you know the answer. He looked at me really strangely. I did that uh, just to, to spike him up a little bit. And he said, "What do you mean in two sentences? It's impossible." You know, the 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 general knowledge is is, is so huge. So they, these are usually the most difficult questions. I was on the other side of this just a, a month ago. Uh, a journalist asked me, yeah, "Can you explain this machine learning in one sentence?" And it was like, um, "And I teach machine learning, you know." And so it's, it it was a problem. Um, anyway. What ABML does, it asks very, very specific questions about a very, very specific patient or a case. It doesn't have to be a patient, but in medical um, domains, it's usually a patient. So it, it, when it asks you a very, very specific question, usually the answer that we've got uh, was really positive. So the, 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 the whole narrative was really smooth. Uh, because sometimes we already got the answer, oh, I know this patient. I've seen him last week. I know exactly why, why machine learning thinks this way, but it's wrong. Uh, so coming up with arguments that are quite specific is really, really uh, easy. But on the other side, it's also really, really helpful. So the whole loop. Um, first, machine learning performs very much in a standard way. Um, that's the first iteration. So it learns a model, and this model learns to predict something. So what we were doing is uh, we were trying to, to um, in this particular case uh, that I'm going to mention later, is we were trying to, to discern Parkinson's tremor for an essential tremor. It's quite a hard differential diagnosis for neurologists, uh, and that was our target. Um, so it learns a model. The model is not perfect, um, and of course it makes mistakes. So then the model basically tells me, okay, I found a critical example. A critical example is one example of, for example, a patient that was classified as, uh, as uh, case A, but he was with, in fact, uh, case or class uh, B. And this is an error, of course. And the most critical, you can see, like perhaps a rule that is the most wrong or perhaps the case when you assign probabilities so is, okay, I say this patient is 90% healthy. Uh, and if it's wrong, this is a really big mistake. If the computer says, I, I think this patient is, or this person is 55% healthy, that's a much lesser mistake. So finding the most critical example and then asking the domain expert, the clinician in this particular case, what do you think? Why is this, uh, why is this uh, patient misclassified? Well, why is the model wrong? Uh, and usually we've got a, a, a very nice answer to that. So the expert explains this example. The algorithm is then returned back, relearned, so you get a different model uh, accounting for that particular argument. Mind you, not for just that case, but for all the cases. So uh, this constraint or regularization is really, really helpful in this respect. It's, the models are more explainable. There's another mechanism. Um, basically, this critical example, after being explained and after adding the arguments of, um, to, the, to, the, to the example, uh, computer sometimes is very helpful in this dialogue uh, with coming up counterexamples. So, for example, it says, okay, you explain this, but for example, look at the other patient that is very similar or maybe even identical in the description, but with a different class. So, how do you explain for that? And usually the, 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 the expert then comes, ah, yes, that's true, and kind of refines the argument itself. So, see, it's a, it's a continuous debate, uh, but it flows surprisingly smoothly because the questions are usually kind of easy to answer. So not those broad um, questions with, uh, that you would uh, explain for, um, for a very long time, right? Okay, and this is a loop, and it's a double loop as you can see. So it is continuously flows uh, until in the end, um, can you come to the theory or, or uh, where there are no um, no uh, counter examples or uh, rather no critical examples anymore or when you cannot improve anymore really. So what usually happens, um, what usually happens is that the theory learned is much more um, kind of explainable because it's in the language of the expert. Um, so in this case it's kind of trustworthy or more trustworthy, and usually what happens as well is that the accuracy of these models actually improves. Um, not so much due to the algorithmic changes, but because of the arguments that kind of in many, many cases come as new features. 
that's a good side and a bad side. It has a good side and a bad side. The, the, the bad side is because we're constantly adding new arguments, so new knowledge, so new feature, new description of the patient, or kind of modifying the, the, the features that are already there. So kind of doing the feature construction, feature selection uh, process, really, with this uh, um, semi-manual process. Um, it cannot be fully automated, so it kind of remains this need um, for the continuous dialogue. It cannot be just the expert doing it. Uh, you need both sides to do it. Uh, the good side, of course, is that you improve any any accuracy of, of any algorithm that I've already mentioned before. So the data set, I'll just briefly go through that. We've tried this just to understand the size of it. Um, it was around 100 patients. And as I said, this is a really difficult problem, uh, even for trained neurologists, to discern between these two, uh, these two, these two tremors. And uh, many are initially misdiagnosed um, into the other class. Okay, I will skip this part just for the. Um, I'll just mention the last part there. So you see, the accuracy is really improved a lot. It's not due to, again, it's not mainly due to the the, the machine learning being different, it's due to new knowledge being inserted into the system. This is, this is the contribution of doing this loop, of involving the expert into it in a, uh, in a kind of good way, I would say. Okay, this led us to, and this project is now 10 years old, really, uh, to Parkinson Check, uh, which is an app on mobile phones. Um, it's still operative. It's uh, it's being used uh, in in clinic. What we're trying to do now is basically from this spiral drawing, we we try to um, pair it with uh, unified Parkinson's disease rating scale, at least some items in it, because if there is a very good correlation between that, you suddenly have a mechanism for patients to basically um, kind of assess themselves at home. So kind of continuous monitoring, which is objective um, instead of diaries that are quite subjective, which they're doing now. Um, so this could be, this could be an interesting thing in the future. And spirals look like this. So these are a bit ideal ones. Um, but, uh, actually I've shown the non-ideal ones here with the data set. Uh, no, it's not here. Went too far away, um, except they are small. But you can see some f patterns that there are in, um, and also these patterns were kind of explained by the by the domain knowledge, not just by the computer. Anyhow, I'll skip to the second part of my talk, um, which also might be interesting uh, for this community. Um, this is the Parent Project. Uh, so Parent is a Marie Curie um, ITN network. So 15 PhD students uh, working on early diagnosis of uh, motor or um, cognitive impairments in uh, preterm children. Um, this is an ongoing project, finishes end of next year. So we're kind of in the middle right now. Also, this has some background. Uh, so um, I'm kind of wearing two hats here. I um, am also part owner of a company um, that is researching um, methods via eye tracking to um, to come up with the with the early detection of signs of uh, um, dementia, but actually even before that, uh, mild cognitive impairment. So any cognitive impairment, we want to detect it as soon as possible, when there still might be possibility to at least train or or delay um, uh, the disease. And just a teaser, maybe uh, one result that we've got. Um, so this is just part of a model. This is just one variable. You can see uh, this was a uh, relatively big trial. Uh, and the underlying data is from around 200 um, people. So it's uh, it's healthy end patients alike in that data set. Um, the variable that is uh, that is shown here. So FXT. It's number of fixation per time unit. So basically, how many times during reading in this particular case, reading just, a, just a, I think it was 11 lines of text uh, on a computer screen, um, how many times you stop, uh, or rather how many times you stop per time unit. And you can see it's a pretty, pretty good indication that this progress is from healthy to borderline 
to uh, mild cognitive impairment to patients with actual dementia. So it's, it's kind of noticeable and it progresses, it's a continuum. It's not the only variable that did that. I can tell you an even better one was how different in length these fixations are, so these stopping points. It kind of, it's associated with confusion during reading. So if, if people get uh, confused and then start looking around and for some, some parts they look really quick, uh, quickly at and some parts they take much longer. So this is how we actually got involved uh, because our group is uh, in the parent project is, uh, is uh, tasked with uh, coming up with a neuropsychological test battery for children for detecting cognitive, but also potentially motor impairment, because a lot of things can be actually seen from the eye movements um, that we measure. So this is a col collaboration uh, with KU Leuven, um, and uh, that one is still to start, will start in October, uh, and also with, uh, with the hospital in Cadiz. Uh, they were the main protagonists of this, uh, of this project. Uh, we already have uh, kind of 100 uh, children recorded, preterm children, um, and it's really interesting. So one of the interesting things that we've learned is that it's uh, possible, uh, I was really afraid at the start of that, so it's possible to uh, measure with eye tracking, which is completely uh, uninvasive, of course. It's possible to measure children from three months onward. Um, I thought, and when we were writing a project, I was kind of pushing for a uh, for higher ages, but they wanted this at this stage, of course, for early for early detection. Um, it's actually interesting that two year olds are harder to measure because they want to touch the eye tracker, they monitor everything else, which is not true with three or six months old. Um, so basically, the the battery that kind of looks like this for uh, for very young children is now being transformed into, into a cartoon that is uh, basically uh, like a game for them, but all the, all the ingredients are still the same. It's just their, their mask for their, for their interest. Um, so surprisingly, perhaps, Smooth Pursuit Task gives you a lot of information, also a lot of information for, uh, I can tell you, for the uh, detecting mild cognitive impairment in the elderly. Um, I was actually quite surprised at this. Um, the attention task, uh, which is basically a prosecate task. Uh, there's some memory task involved, uh, social orienting tasks. Uh, so many, many things that we've picked up from the literature, uh, but also came up with ourselves from the previous research on the elderly, completely different population, I know, but uh, still sometimes you can do this transfer learning, um, so to speak. Um, it is hopefully gonna 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 work, but uh, but the, the part is unclear. So we're in the stage of gathering the data currently at 100 preterm children and still to be added on. It kind of works in the in the elderly, so we're kind of keeping our fingers crossed. Anyway, the contact. Uh, if you want any cooperation, if you want uh, <laughs> knowledge engineers, data scientists to bug you with questions uh, in the ABML loop. Uh, this is, this is my, uh, this is my and my colleagues. Um, she was also supposed to be here, but she, but she's teaching today. It's the last day of the semester for them. Uh, these are the email addresses. Uh, I'll be around, of course. And uh, also um, the application can be downloaded uh, from the, from the webpage there. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Do we have any questions? I'm just curious, are you also following in time uh, how this eye tracking is changing for the kids when they're three, six, nine months old? Actually, we are. Um, so they're just calling them back. Uh, we have no idea yet uh, what is going on, but it's, uh, it's definitely uh, something that this, pro this particular project gives us the opportunity to do. It's also interesting for the for the elderly, but uh, it's harder to get the opportunity, you know, because then it has to be the same person. You have to track it, or the longitudinal process. I can tell you something that uh, in some cases, of course, the the, the computer's assessment is kind of inconclusive, so kind of like a gray line. In this particular case, the idea is, of course, to call them back in in six months, uh, something like that. But that's the stage of it. Um, with the children, it's it's actually happening. Um, kind of comparing the trajectories of the normally developing versus uh, potentially impaired. Yeah. Okay. Any other ones? 
Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I have a more technical question about the device that you used for eye tracking. It was a camera, a PC camera, or a, a Toby glasses? It's Toby uh, uh, as well, yeah, <laughs> one of the most well-known. <laughs> um, surprisingly, perhaps, we've started at the low end. So it's not the glasses, it's, uh, it's uh, computer screen-based. Mm -hmm. So it's just a little piece of equipment that you stuck on with a magnet uh, underneath the computer screen. Uh, it, it's, it, the technology really got great in the last five to seven years. Before you had to wear glasses, you had to be fixated. Mm -hmm. uh, this, there, there's been a, a bunch of advances in, the, in this case. I remember because kind of like five to seven years ago, I couldn't participate because I was wearing glasses in this experiment. And yes. now that's a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I said, the surprising thing is that we started at the low end. So really, this is a 90 hertz or even 60 hertz eye tracker, mm -hmm. which is much, much cheaper than the, the, the 1000 hertz or, or, or something bigger. We might need that um, for motor impairments, for cognitive, maybe not. Mm -hmm. okay. Because it's the finer movement, of course, that, that you want to detect. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have one more question. Sure. <laughs> like we're a group of questions. <laughs> um, Please. Re regarding the ABML that you were explaining in the beginning. So um, these are, I assume even with ABML, these are quite small data sets. So how do you accommodate for bias that you have your domain experts that maybe just not one domain expert, there are a couple of them. And how, how do you tackle that? Um, that's a very good question. Um, to be honest, we don't really. Um, we put our hopes in the domain access. We do understand their bias. I mean, the machine learning algorithm, in a way, fights against that with counterexamples, as I've seen. You know, because when they're biased, I, I think I know what you mean with that, because I've seen that with clinicians many times. They came to me and said, look, I know CRP is high. I know that the tumor recurrence will happen in a month. And Yes, of course, they saw four cases that happens, but the other 50 were not happening. And when I sh showed them the plots, they were saying, ah, well, damn. Mm -hmm. uh, so the computer is really good at that because it's, it's a machine. Uh, so no feelings there, um, no bias in that respect. And country examples are, are kind of good in this respect. We, we show you, look, this is the same patient but doesn't have this condition. So you either refine the argument or you basically skip the argument altogether. You say, okay, maybe I was not explaining this well. So it's really a two-way constant communication. That's why it cannot be fully automated. Uh, thank you. Okay, on behalf of Elinka, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, I think this is all. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Uh,